Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. So as a prelude to the up and coming main gear season and the excitement and anticipation that goes with it, we sit down with John Carroll in this two-part series to discuss some of the details of main deer camps, uh, a lot of the paralleling factors that many deer camps share within the state and the important implications in those traditions. So maybe you're preparing your stuff for deer season or you're driving into deer camp Sit back and relax. Take a listen to this conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. So this is part one of a two-part series. Enjoy. Welcome to the Main Outdoor Enthusiast Podcast. I'm Paul. And I'm Mark. And this week, we've got a special guest with us all the way from Alaska. He's a superintendent of Kenai Fjords National Park, Maine native and outdoorsman, John Carroll. Welcome, John. Thank you. So what yeah. brings you back home to Maine? Uh, a couple of things. Just came home to see the family, but yeah. uh, getting ready to go to deer camp with uh, with my brother and my cousins. You didn't come all the way here for this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I drove up here today. For it. <laughs> now, John, I bet you probably there's not a day that goes by that you're in Alaska that you don't think of uh, your deer camp and I, coming home. I, I think not, of it. Not, yeah, every not a day. day. Every yeah. day, and I've been blessed. Uh, I, yeah. I've had a great career with the federal government. I've been all over the the country, Mark, and I've hunted out west and in Alaska oh, yeah. and yeah. fished. But uh, I'm telling you, I don't know what it is. There's no place like there's, there's something my next about Maine. This is there? swell, and uh, yeah, yeah. October comes around, and yeah. and I want to get back home to the North Maine woods. The heartbeat kind of goes down. It does. Oh, yeah. It, it really great. does. Feels great. Well, to it's Maine. it's. Uh, it's a tradition and the memories you have as a kid. It's it's what you know. It's what you've known all your life. And uh, So you grew up hunting and fishing in the North Main Woods. You guys have a camp up there. We do. Correct. My father was a warden for the yep. state and uh, started out as a game warden up yep. in Clayton Lake in the 60s and uh, had a great time, met some great people, worked with Charlie Davis out at Daquam and Arnold Bleckus uh, was up at St. Palmfield, I believe, and Went through warden school with one of the Pelletier boys, you oh, know, yeah. Leonard Jr. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We know, those, and those uh, guys are legends. You know, yeah, a lot are. of legends. And and uh, but my family is from the coast, and my father's older brother, Big John, John H. Carroll, yep. uh, was a coastal warden, and so my father ended up transferring over and became a coastal warden as well. So, Marine they, Patrol officer, Marine was Patrol, it? officer. Marine Patrol, yeah. Yep. They both had very successful careers. They ended up both retiring as lieutenants. Uh, I have another cousin who joined the department, Dick LaHaye. He retired as a lieutenant. Okay. And my younger brother, Jay Carroll, retired as the colonel. Okay. How long was your father a game warden? My dad was a game warden, I think, two or three years. Okay. And that, you said Clayton Lake? Yep. Did you go up there at all? Was this before you were born? This was, was all before I was okay. born. Okay. And that was, you said, mid-60s or so? He, that was 1964 he got assigned up there. And what I a, was born in 68. What a place to be in the 60s, Clayton Lane. Yes. That yeah. would have been, that's a deer awesome. hunter's dream. That yeah. was like, that was like Maine's prime, yeah. prime deer hunting, 50s yeah. and 60s. That's, that, uh, that's not very far from McNally's, which is a famous sporting yep. camp up there. Yep. And that, uh, that McNally Road, instead of some good deer hunting up there at that yeah. time. So, uh, again, to go back to the beginning talking about our upbringing uh my father became a coastal warden and and uh his patrol area was down in Goolsboro, maine and my, okay. my parents had a hundred acre farm and woodlot down there and five kids and my mom was a stay-at-home mom my dad was a warden right. they had huge gardens and uh he went deer hunting every fall and when my, bro when, when my brother and i were old enough he'd drag us along with him and we'd go down we had a back road it used to be old u.s route one Mm -hmm. All right, yep, and it yep. had been changed, and uh, new Route One was, you know, a mile and a half to the to the south of of this piece of road, and we'd go down the back road. And my father would set my brother and I up with the, we each had a Model ninety four, oh, thirty two special, and a thirty thirty, and he'd say, "You watch this way, you watch that way, and I'll be back in an hour, so <laughs> don't move." Yeah. But uh, anyway, our, we grew up. My father got promoted, Paul. Uh, he was a sergeant, and, and uh, he got transferred down to the southern part of the state, down to Scarborough. But our, the kids were in school, and my, they had just built a brand-new house, so we stayed down east. Um, I'm my father was commuting back and forth there for a year or so, and then he got promoted again to lieutenant. And when you were the okay. lieutenant within your division, you could live anywhere within your division. 
So we ended up moving back to Mount Desert Island, which is where we're from. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So my dad was born and brought up in Southwest Harbor, and we went back to Southwest Harbor. This okay. was before my brother and I went into high school. My older siblings were already graduated, <clears throat> uh, and then uh, spent our career at MDI in high school, played football, basketball, all that stuff. Yeah. And... It was about that time, 1982. We weren't in high school yet. I was but born. Uh, I, my grandfather had started taking me over to our camp okay. in the 70s. and uh, Up in the North Main Woods. Up in the North Main Woods. Yeah. And, uh, and you were hooked. Literally, I was hooked. It was, it was the, the most different experience I'd ever had yeah. as an eight or nine-year-old kid. I, ro- I rode up with my grandfather, and he just told me, he said, listen, when we're at camp, there are some unwritten laws and rules, you know, you're going to eat what's put in front of you. Cause I was a little yeah. boy yeah. and he said, uh, and your job is to make sure that the water buckets stay full. Yes. In the wood box. In the wood box yeah. stays full. Yeah. We called, and, yeah. One of your friends that Paul, was it, uh, Zach, Zach. his, his yeah. name one year was Woodbox. Yeah. Woodbox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was his just job. The Woodbox, so. Isn't it strange that kind of everybody yeah. does their yeah. camp the same way. And, and my grandfather told me, he said, when we're at camp, we take care of our camp as good as you would if you were at home. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, so we clean up after ourselves. We, when when the meal is over, we do the dishes. And uh, and back then, you know, IP maintained the road so well. We went to camp in a car. Yeah, wow. It, yeah. That's a Jeez. long way in the woods. El, El Camino. Oh, a- but back then, Daquam was open. The okay. border was open. Yeah. So we would drive... We would leave Southwest Harbor and go up to Greenville and then Jackman into Canada okay. and cross back through Daquam. And and you could drive around on the logging roads up there. Piece of cake with the car. Yeah, it was easy. Okay. And the roads were super highways. And uh, my grandfather loved to, after after supper, uh, you know, if we didn't have plans to fish or whatever, he always wanted to go for a ride to, to look at wildlife. Yeah. And it was so amazing because for the first time... And I don't want this to sound wrong, but when I was at camp, I was treated as an equal. Mm-hmm. Yes. You weren't yeah. treated like a kid. Like a kid. Right. You were treated nope. as an equal. And yeah. uh, and to be honest, too, both those men, they were such gentlemen. Uh, you know, they always put me in the best fishing location. Yeah. And, and they were excited because yeah. I'd be catching trout. And I, you know, it, fired up. The same happened with me, you know, deer hunting. They would put, if someone shot a deer on it, we had a couple of nice crossings. And yeah, it was always offered to the kid or the younger ones first because there was Zach up there yeah, as well. Yeah. And yeah, you probably didn't really realize it, or at least I didn't fully at the time. But yeah, you got preferential. You got the sweet spots before the other guys did. And you're doing that now, Paul, when you take the kids out bird hunting yeah. or whatever, they get first crack. And, and you don't you don't you don't feel a bit bad. No. It doesn't even cross get, your mind. They you get know, first crack and and because of that, well, you miss a lot of birds and yeah. stuff. They're they're young yeah. and I mean, it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth, it's worth it, it for sure. I, I'm going to be honest. My grandfather was a garden hackle guy. Yeah. He's fishing he around and he wanted way. to catch <laughs> trout <laughs> no, to I, take I, home. I, I fished with the, yeah, the angle worm. For, yeah, my brother and myself and my cousins, I, I, I'm going to go general here. I bet they haven't killed a fish in uh, 30 years. No kidding. Uh, yeah. They all fly fish. We all fly fish. And back in the 70s, my grandfather brought a fly rod to camp, made me go down in front of camp, taught me 10 to 2. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it wasn't a weight forward line or anything back then. Just level. But he said, level line, you yeah. stand here. And he told me it was always about rules and things with him. Yeah. And he's like, you got to remember when you're fishing, you got to give people space. And he said, when you're fly fishing, you need to triple that space. Yeah. And he said, uh, so I want you to stand down here at the mouth of the brook and just practice casting. And so I did that, and I'm down there practicing one one afternoon. How we, old were you then, John? I was you probably think? nine or ten. Okay. Yeah. And I went, obviously was not good. Didn't no, know what I was it... doing. And uh, But the fishery was so amazing. I'm not kidding, Paul. I slatted that fly out there and... A 13-inch brook trout took that thing, and I got that on the beach. I unhooked that trout, ran up across the brook, up the bank, ran into the camp, and I said, so look, proud. look at that trout. Yeah. And my grandfather looked at me. He goes, that is one beautiful fish. 
where's your fly rod? And I sat on the ground down there by the brook, and he goes, don't ever lay your fly rod on the ground. (laughs) And we used to fish a lot of places. There was a a pool, and it's since been destroyed by nature. The river got high and moved some rocks around. Things changed. There was a pool they called the culvert pool. We'd park there and hike down through the woods a quarter of a mile, and at the end of that brook in the river was a great big deep pool, and you could lay on those rocks and look at 20 trout that were all 15 to yeah. 20 inches. Fish that pool yeah. all day long. Yep. Yeah. And just, yeah. it was just yeah. amazing. And yeah. very few people. Yeah. yeah. We, you, you didn't see anybody back then, but that's, that's another point. Again, I'm not trying to jump around, but you've no. done so many great videos, both of you talking about how things have changed and mm. are we losing yeah. our hunting, our, our future. And, and my brother and I were talking about that the other night and, and he agrees with you. He thinks uh, it is different now that we used to see more people up there. All the, when I was in high school, well, middle school, I should say, there, there was a lot of kids that after school, if it was like a non-sport time of year, it was going down back with worm rods. Right, down Fishing Lib- the brook. Libby yeah. Brook or whatever, um, yeah. Bird hunting. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know any kids that do that, especially on their own. Right. Like it was... We didn't weren't told to go do this. We it was under our own accord. Go dig some worms, and head out back. We and, did the yeah, same thing. and go yeah. fishing. And I don't. I think there's too much. And we've talked about this a thousand times. There's so much available for people to do nowadays. That's just easy access. You don't even have to get up off your rear. And video games. And, and, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, what yeah. do they call that? Uh, social media. And yeah. yeah. All the <laughs> that stinking yeah. YouTube. Well, I like YouTube. Yeah, I, do yeah, like, I am yeah. not. On, I like the hunting stuff. Yeah, on I'm not on Facebook or anything like that. I'm but not I either. do. My wife tells me I do have a problem with YouTube. I hunting and I've subscribed to a lot of channels. I will. So. I will say YouTube wise, I use it for a lot of to reference stuff or or to figure out how to do something. Like if you're working on your truck or something, and yeah. you want a nifty little way to maybe T T P M S sensor, like yeah, I got that to go out. There's all kinds yeah. of little. Yeah, tips and tricks you can learn that people know. So it's a great avenue for that. Yeah, but yeah, social media, Instagram. I've never understood Instagram. I don't get the. I, I don't even know what whole, that is. I don't either. I'm on there, but I've I don't do much with there, it. And I, I know the name. That's it. That's as far as it goes. Yeah. Don't know what it is. Yeah. So. But there, there's yeah, there's a lot vying for people's time. Uh, I often say I'm a dinosaur in a lot of regards. So there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes yeah, I am a dinosaur. So you also hunted from this camp. Absolutely. That's- so again, to go back, just to tell you, after my grandfather had taken me on a few trips up fishing in the spring, I begged my father for years, can we go to camp and go deer hunting? And that was, you got to remember a different animal. Yeah. Because in November up there, you can get snow. Oh, yeah. And my father, we had a station wagon. Yep. We, we didn't have a truck. That would. And uh, in 1982... I don't know how we did it, but I convinced my dad to take us deer hunting up to camp. Yeah. And so in 1982, he and another warden friend of his took my brother and I. We loaded up the station wagon, drove to Jackman up through Canada. No kidding. Came in across Daquam, went to camp, just had a great trip. You know, my again, my brother and I talking, like, we both have kids, and uh, Jay's like, you know... I can't believe he allowed us to do some of the stuff that we did because I would never do that with my kid. But we got to camp, and after things were settled in, and my father had always been, always, because he was a warden, it was always about firearm safety. Oh, yeah. right. You don't yeah, flag right. people. You treat the wet gun as if yep. it's loaded all the time, right. blah, blah, blah. We got to camp, and we said, well, Dad, you know, there's some daylight. Can we go see if we can shoot a bird? And he yep. said, yeah, go ahead, grab the shotgun. And we're like, what? <laughs> he said, take that shotgun and take that shotgun. You guys can walk up the camp road. Yeah. Because it was, you know, it's a quarter of a mile long yep. camp road. And uh, shoot your birds. We shot a rabbit. Did you really? <laughs> the, it's funny you mentioned <laughs> that, Paul. The, the most, uh, the best bird, bird hunting I ever had at, at one time, Jody and I, we both right shot Right in the camp deer, driveway. Right in the camp driveway. Yep. We saw, I think, seven birds, and we got all seven. Wow. Yeah, I got four and Jody got three. Yeah. That's I awesome. got a picture of that. Yeah, right in the camp dooryard, right in the driveway. Yeah. yeah. Now that that is so important for a kid to do that stuff. Well, I mean, and, are, and when we were talking earlier Paul about the whole thing, we were just it, 
and I again don't want to sound derogatory at all or negative. It, it, we were treated differently when we yeah. got to camp. It was a different level you of were, independence. It was. It was oh, yeah. okay. You're going to be treated yeah. as equal. You have these responsibilities, and okay, you can take the shotgun. I'm going to trust you. You guys be safe. You walk up to that road, but then you come back. With those responsibilities come privileges. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. And it, you didn't violate those that trust because you knew your the privilege of going up there hinged on your It was special. Yes. It you did. did not want to lose that privilege. Yep, so it did. yeah. It yeah. did. I can remember that. I mean, we all went through the same thing. Paul went through the exact same yep. thing. He yep. started at ten years old going up with us, the men. I think that is yep. awesome. Yeah, 10 and years old. Yeah, I remember that trip like it was yesterday. Yeah. Going up, I can remember stopping at a Y in the road. You had to use the bathroom. Yeah. And it was a, I think it was crystal clear night and uh, snow on the ground. And we get out and I get out to use the bathroom. And we were only a few miles from camp. Yeah. And uh, we were on the Churchill Dam Road. Yeah. And I can remember getting out looking at deer tracks. Yeah. In the snow. And oh. I never, yeah, there, there was some deer up there at that I time, never so. forget that. And I yeah. remember you go, oh, look, 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 look. Yeah. here's a, here's a buck and a doe. And I just, that is stuck in my mind. And then going into camp that first trip. Yeah. That That's like Paul says, that's where our heart is. That's where we grew up. And even to this day, a lot of people in this town, you're not hunting and you're not in the woods until you get in what they call the big woods. Yeah. yeah. Until you get west of uh, Ashland. Go yeah. through the gate. Yeah, you're not in. You know, no. Paul. Still, I, I really love the video where you guys killed the two deer the one morning. Yeah, that was. And I'm not asking the was, location. I'm just yeah, saying. No, that was when you know. And and we learned that you just said it. You just said verbatim. We learned many years ago as a group because when we first started hunting serious in the big woods, we didn't know what we were doing. No, that was it's huge country. Oh yeah, it is. But we soon yeah. learned there are pockets. Yeah, of deer, Th that's it. And yeah. we had to go find where the deer were, yeah. and then start you hunting. Get down to hunting. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that was always the problem, John, because if you had a week off, and you know we would send different guys in different locations, and they would come back that first night or two, and you know, well, this is what I've seen, and this is, you know, I right, listen, I really found a good spot, and we'd yeah. we'd all go take there. notes. In cross yeah, because each other. it would change from year to year. We had our general spots that we would, you know, we had pretty good luck at. But we would, yeah, we would try to try to scout out a little more. And uh, and it yeah. became, it seemed like once 2000, 2001 hit, it seemed like we were going further and, and further, further away. Then we were traveling like an hour, hour and a half right. from camp to go. And we were lucky hunt. that way because we, our camp was in the middle of it the camaraderie of a big group like you have yeah, yeah. a lot of family we do. that's even more special for you john because it is family and it's your one time to get together it is and, and we so do that, that super and special that draws and, everybody. and the, our family has been really good we our family luckily has always been pretty close mm, anyway yeah but uh it's bringing the next generation up. I've got a nine-year-old son. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to be interested yep. in hunting. He certainly, at nine years old, thinks he likes guns. Sure that, yep. He carries around yeah. his toy guns and all that. Um, and he tells me he wants to go to camp with me. But he's also very interested in hockey and yep. video games yep. and everything else yep. that a nine-year-old is. So. Yep. My brother is excited. His son lives and works down in Florida. His son is coming home Thursday and going to go to camp with us. Uh, Jimmy has only gone up to camp uh, a couple of times before, but once deer hunting. And so Jay is really excited because he thinks Jimmy is is getting hooked. Okay. And so we're we're excited about that. Yeah. We're we're hoping we can find Jimmy some birds. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Keep get, keep him know, interested. Uh, yeah. We. The, the green light will be on on birds this year. There'll be a lot of years when we're at camp, honestly. Uh, if if it's not a great bird year, we'll put the red light out. No one yeah. will shoot birds just because yeah. it's not a great year. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. But Jimmy's coming, and we're hoping he can shoot some birds. Uh, so, John, how do you guys – so multiple guys using the camp and whatnot. Who, yeah. How do you guys do maintenance and stuff like that? How do you manage, we, uh, manage that? So – that's the other great thing is we go to camp quite often. Yeah. I say quite often. There's always a, a fishing trip in June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Then in August, uh, we will go to the camps 
and do what we call work weekend. Yeah, we yeah, used to we do, used do work. And so work everyone work. goes, and yeah. we'll have eight or nine pickup trucks, and we go cut firewood, mm-hmm. and then everybody processes firewood, stacks firewood, yep. puts the firewood away. My brother goes up, uh, and we'll weed whack, and if, if that needs to be done, we'll go up and... And like the camp down on the St. John River, uh, if, like right now, I know there are trees down in the camp road, and we're going to have to yeah. clean those up, cut those out, clean that up. So there's always something to do, but but that is generally how we do it. Um, and every now and then, honestly, Paul, like we might get a whim and go, hey, what are you doing? You, you got a week. Let's go to camp. No kidding. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, yeah, and go do just putter around. Yeah. Yeah. And there would always be a, a fairly big project, Paul, when we had to work. Project. Yeah, like, maybe shingle the camp or stain it or whatever. New outhouse hole. Yep, that, that was always do fun. Do a new outhouse. Yep. Well, you guys, you guys have a mansion. Well, this, now, your, yeah. camp, your yeah. camp is no, beautiful. No, this, Our camps this, this, are rough. No, this, Dad, Dad has done a lot of work to it. It was an old log well, cabin. Yeah. Your, that, the flooring you did and yeah. and your cabinets and the wood, yeah. the interior wood. It's I mean, come a long way. That ways. is gorgeous. But, I got to tell back you, Back a John, few years ago, well, the wind blew. If you were sitting against one wall in particular, yeah. you were cold. You felt okay. the wind Curtains were blown in the wind shoulders. inside, weren't they, Paul? Yeah, yeah, this camp, if you... When my wife and I... And it's been in the family since 19... Around 1960, so... Uh, got it from my mom and dad. Dad passed away 30 years ago, and mom sold it to us, I think, in 2005. Probably should have been bulldozed. This camp, an old log cabin in, in bad, bad shape. Original plan was to retire, tear it down, and build a house and live there, my wife and I. But we're so close to the water, Lurk wouldn't allow it. They yeah. they said I had 50% replacement. I, ha- I was able to maintain the property and 50% replacement of the, the cabin. So we worked with what we had. And uh, made it what it is. It's still half an old log cabin, and you know, but we have oh, made it comfortable, yeah, and and livable. And, and I think uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, what, what, it what I've seen Thank, in your videos. Yeah, it's come a long way. It's beautiful. No, it yeah. is. We we beautiful. enjoy it. We yeah. enjoy it. So spent a lot of time there. Being yeah. retired, I spent a, my wife and I spend a lot of time there. Yeah, my uh, my family's camp's really rustic. Like I said, it's only gas lights. There is no electrical type hookup of any sort. That's, no. Um, and it's an outhouse. There's no running water. We go to that's, the brook. That's the way to do it. Buckets, that's your running water. <laughs> and we go to the spring to get our drinking and cooking water. My brother yeah. and my cousin's camp, that's a little more modern. It, it, whoever put that camp in there, that's an old modular that okay. has kind of been turned into a camp. They have running water to the degree it's it's pressure fed from a spring up on a ridge behind them. Oh yeah. So they nice. do have a flush toilet and they have a, a, a the sink they can turn yep. water on. Uh, they have since put in a shower that is no heated fear. up off of a propane thing that they yep. bought. Yep. Uh, yep. So that's really a nice convenience. That's the camp is wired, so we have a little Yamaha generator, two thousand watt. And to get well, a little bit of it's very quiet. You fire that up, and and yeah, wait, they have gas lights too, but uh, yeah, that's either way, gas or, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. generator. Yeah. I like the rustic, the simpler the better, yeah. Sometimes, but, like I say, that uh, being getting up there in age 65, you you remember that as a young man, like you yeah. were saying, I was a young man in my 20s when we started it, and yeah, it was good times. You didn't mind going to the outhouse when it was nine below zero or whatever. You didn't, I remember. You didn't dilly dally though. No, you didn't, no, you didn't. You didn't spend. We, no, you didn't spend a lot of time there. I remember midweek guys would take a shower on the back steps. Yeah, yeah. Warm bucket of water. We used to do the same quick. thing: a shower yeah. bag off yeah. the back yeah. step, yeah. heat it up on the stove, and you're you're out yeah. there trying to rinse yeah. off, as and fast you know your hair possible. is freezing faster than you can. Yeah, yeah. Good times, my yeah. goodness, good times, the best. So another thing that's interesting, you guys are primarily trackers because you've done that your whole hunting career, haven't yeah. you, Mark? Yeah, And so that's yeah, another thing. I told you when we first started hunting the big woods and not knowing what we were doing, um, we have done everything. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, when we got old enough that all of us had our driver's licenses and we owned pickup trucks, you know, I used to ride yeah, to try and find deer yeah. and find an area where we, we, I was seeing deer. 
some of our other camp guys did the same thing. Yeah. And again, we're all related. My brother and and one of our camp guys, Harold Hubner, who uh, is actually my brother's brother-in-law, okay. they're married to sisters. Harold's a professional arborist, and you know he and Jay, we we would scout and scout and scout. They'd find a spot that they liked deer. Uh, they thought there were going to be some deer. Yeah, and we invested, and all of us bought ladder tower stands. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They'd drive. They'd be in their stand before you know an hour before daylight. No kidding. And sit until dark. I could not do that in November. Neither could I. I could not do that. I've my, tried bro- that. my brother would wear trans-Alaskan boots. Yeah, I could And not they do would no be kidding. dressed so heavy, and they would carry something to be able to urinate that, if they that, needed to There were to go guys the at camp that could do that. Yeah. And I, Dale I could was always kind of envious. Dale, Dale could sit. Because that takes a yeah. whole other skill set. Oh. Like, I, I could never do that. I'd yeah. be 15 minutes into it, I'm going... Oh, it's only been 15 minutes. Holy smokes. <laughs> yes. Especially at this stage of the game where circulation, <laughs> I, I get cold quick. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really uh, appreciate the dedication that it would take to do that. Oh, Especially they, in a tree where, you know, on the ground, you can get up, move around, walk, you know, or whatever once yeah. in a while. But when you're you're tied down, when you're in a tree stand or a, yep. or, or a tripod, ladder stand or whatever, you're... I think we were, the group of guys we hunted with, though, they were always opportunists. Right, they would do anything. Well, you that, you had to be Paul because you don't always have the snow. No, so you're not going to always be a tracker, and so, yeah, we definitely uh, uh, trail watch. We had yeah. places that we knew deer traveled, and we would sit and watch. I've shot many deer doing that on the ground. I didn't get in a tree; that was too cold. But on the ground, yeah. I, we had some really good spots that you and I both have shot yeah. numerous deer just watching trails. And so, John, what, what would you say this is primary way you guys hunt is that a mix of everything or it is a mix of everything yep. and it's and it has changed over the years so now in all honesty uh pro- my cousin wid probably rides around because he he'll put some miles on uh uh because he wants to find where he thinks the biggest concentration yep. of deer are yep. mm. my cousin mike carroll is has always been a, a tracker no, no kidding he wants to walk um michael has patience but I think he's a lot like your dad. If he's going to sit, it's probably not going to be for too long. Yeah. He might go yeah. put an hour in, and then he's going to get up and do something. I'm that same way. Um, and primarily for me, I don't know what it is getting older, but I prefer now to walk. Yeah. Um, we Again, in the beginning, when we get to camp, uh, everybody gets in vehicles, and, and we get out and try and locate. It's going to spread out. Yeah, and, locate the pockets yeah. of deer, and we all talk in code, you know. And we we have codes yeah. for everything too, yeah. and and yeah. uh, everybody comes back to camp, and we we explain what we saw, and then we make game plans. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and it really is. That's my brother and I were talking about this last night, and uh, you know, the greatest thing about deer hunting in Maine and growing up doing it is, for us anyway, with our family, and I think it's the same with you, is the passion that's involved and. My father, like Mark was saying about his, my dad was not a super avid deer hunter. Yeah. He he liked to hunt. My dad mm-hmm. actually was yeah. a duck hunter. He no grew kidding. up on the coast of Maine, that and was he insane. said, if you want to have fun, go duck, duck <laughs> hunting. Deer hunting isn't fun. <laughs> Shooting is fun. That's, so, yeah. um, but but my father loved to be at camp. It's and special. when you come through the door at night and you're cold, You've been out hunting all day, and camp is warm, and there it smells good because there's something on the back of the stove that somebody's been cooking. Mm. And my father would mm. have a, a toddy, mm. and yeah. he's waiting for Paul and Mark and John to come through the door, and he would say, "Paul, get get yourself settled, get changed, get comfortable, get whatever you want to have for a drink or whatever." And he said, "And then I want to know what you saw today." Yeah. That was dad, my father, to a T. He loved the social, and he was a, he was a very good entertainer, and somebody yeah. that would make sure you had everything you needed. You were comfortable. Yeah. Whether and he he loved that part of it, making sure everybody was fed, and and uh, he loved to put on his wool pants and his wool coat and his wool vest and look the part. Yeah, he wasn't going to go sit in the woods all day long. But he was all about what you just explained. When you come back to camp, 
he was going to make sure that you were comfortable and that yep. he just loved the camp life. Yeah. Yep. And but, he uh, wanted the stories. He wanted to yep. know everything you saw and, yeah. and uh, you know, what happened for the day. And he wanted those reports from every single person that had been out for the day. Yeah. yeah. And that was really important to him. And it just made us feel close. And, it does. Uh, oh, yeah. And makes you feel valued. It it does. Some, yeah. And we just love being together at yeah. camp. It's it's a positive thing. Uh, you know, I love what you said in your video. You guys don't talk politics. Sometimes at our camp, they will get into the politics. But generally, it's we're always talking about game laws or yeah. management of wildlife or or just honestly more about okay, this is what's going on. What are we going to do tomorrow? Yeah. Like I don't recall, I don't recall at camp like politics coming up. Yeah. Arguments about game laws, yes. Yeah. Like yeah. different opinions on what should be done. They'd be going back and forth. Nothing yeah. serious. I mean, no one really losing their their yeah. crap yeah. over it. But and that's not probably really yeah, that's definitely a good thing. You don't want to talk politics no. and stuff up there when you have different, maybe different points of views and stuff. John, so. did, did anyone ever keep a journal? We have a lot of journals. Do you from nineteen fifty six all the way awesome. to today? Wow. That yeah, that's important. Yeah, yeah, and they are protected and preserved. Oh, just yeah. and the camp journals are still at both camps. Nice. I mean, they're newer ones. Yep. But I have, I have journals uh, from the fifties. No wow. kidding. Mm. We but, we've done the same thing. Yeah. I've kept a journal for probably well over thirty years. I've kept a journal, and there's not a day, John, that if I get in the outdoors. I don't do, I don't journal every day, but if I'm anything outdoors, I'm writing it down Yeah. and I'm yeah. writing the weather, who yeah. I'm with, what we saw, you know, moose, yeah. lynx or whatever. Yeah. We're, we're writing it down where we were. And like I say, water conditions, weather conditions. And, yep. Yeah. We, uh, an, another thing that is, uh, that I always enjoyed as a young man, growing up at that camp and doing the outdoor activities was um, we would get guests. People would just pop into camp no kidding. because it's, it's kind yeah. of social up in the North yeah. Maine woods. And so um, I don't know if you gentlemen have ever heard of Earl Weymouth, who uh, was a scaler for IP at Clayton Lake forever. Uh, Earl in his Earl's 95 or 96 years old now no lives down to Dover Foxcroft. Bill Mumbo Cat, who was a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, used wow. to go and stay with really? Earl. Uh, Mumbo Cat and Earl would come into our camp. Camille Bowyer, you know Camille Bowyer? Is that so the Camille, one that had Nine Mile Bridge? Yes, sir. Yes, I watched very, the restoration. Very good friends with my no father kidding. and yes. my grandfather. And, no uh, kidding. And they would fish. And uh, I got a picture in there of Camille. They, sitting at our camp telling stories and you want to know something and my brother was talking about this last night uh they went to earl's camp one night to visit and uh mumbo cat was there and camille and earl and and my brother and my father and dave minktons and when camille bowyer was talking everybody paid attention paid attention no kidding in including bill mumbo cat <laughs> who led the had the strikeout record for the red Sox until uh Roger uh, Clemens. Clemens Clemens broke it. Yeah, yeah, that is so interesting. Yeah. We did the same thing, Paul. We would have the ranger from uh, Churchill Dam. Churchill Dam come in. They would come up. Some and of have the wardens would fly us. in. The wardens yes. would fly yeah. in all yeah. the time and have first have first night at camp was usually a big big lobster to do. stew. Yeah, it was lobster, lobster stew. stew was Sunday night at camp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yep. then you'd kind of get the lowdown on stuff that was going on in the woods. Yeah. And Which was a good thing having those people stop in, John, because they lived there. Pick yeah. their brain. And they knew what was going on. As far, you know, we could kind of pick their brain and maybe yeah. get a get a leg up on the situation on the deer hunting yeah. rather than spending a lot of time looking around. They may tell us, well, you know, over here, there's they've been seeing some deer over in this area yeah. and what whatnot. So yep. same exact thing. Yeah. Earl Earl lived at Clayton Lake in the '60s, and his wife okay. Jean was the postmaster mistress. Okay, yep. And so my father was single when he was a game warden, and uh, they would have my father over and feed him supper every so often. No way. Yeah. How old was your father when he was up there? Must have been early twenties, uh, or yeah, mid mid twenties. No, I think. Or, wow. Okay. He'd just gotten out of the Army. Yeah. My father was a, a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne, and he said when he was getting out of the Army back then, the Army would give tests. 
So he took the written exam for U.S. Border Patrol. He took yeah. the written exam for Maine Warden Service. And he, I think he took the exam for State Police and Coastal Warden. Back yeah. then they called him Marine Patrol. Okay. And uh, the first one to call him was Warden Service. No kidding. And I took the job with them. Korean War or Vietnam? or He never fought. Yeah. He, he served during Vietnam. Yeah. But, My father uh, served. But he never during... got deployed. Yeah. He yeah. said, I don't know how I lucked out, but yeah. he never did. My dad was the same way. He was uh, during the Korean War. Yeah. So how about, how about some deer hunting stories? What do you want? How about, how about your, your first deer? My first deer. So unlike you, which I'm also envious was that your that, first? That was my first deer, yeah. 15 years old. That was, yeah. And I, was, when he he must off. have been depressed because he probably <laughs> said, the poor kid is never going to beat this. That's, That's exactly, exactly what, what I told said. him. Standing <laughs> over the deer. Paul looked That's at exactly. me, John, and he said, ah, Dad, Dad, yeah, you think it goes 200? You think it, and I'm looking at the rock. And he says, you think it goes 200? And I said, who cares? Paul? <laughs> and that's what I told him. I says, I don't know if it'll go 200 or not, but you're going to have a hard time the rest of your life Shooting a bigger rack buck than that. Yeah. That is a massive buck, yeah. Paul. Yeah, that, that is a good one. Wow. Yeah. So I'll be honest. I, I never got to kill a deer when I was a kid. Uh, the first big game animal I killed, I was in high school. Okay. And my father had taken me out of school. Uh, I actually was a, going in my senior year, 1986. Some of the guys who normally went to camp, some stuff had come up and folks had backed out. So my father said... It's just going to be you and I. I'm going to go over to the high school, get you signed out for the week, get all your homework gathered up. I just ended football, and I was getting ready to go into basketball preseason yep. tryouts and all that. And uh, I'd already started for three years, so my coach let me go. I missed two days of tryouts. Uh, but uh, we went to Cockmagomic Lake that year. Okay. And uh, stayed at the warden camp at Cockmagomic Lake, and... Ended up hunting the big ridges there. We, we didn't see any deer, but there were a lot of bear around. And I ended up shooting. My, again, my father collected guns. And yeah. at that time, he was on a kick with the Winchester Model 100s. Okay. The semi-automatics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've shot and, one. Yeah. And yeah. It, the 88 was the lever yeah. action version. Yeah. But uh, I had a, a Winchester Model 100 carbine 308. And yeah. he had a Winchester 100 rifle 284. And we were going up over this ridge. And he goes, John, look right there and there was a nice big black bear sitting there on its haunches looking at us no kidding and i came up with the rifle and i said can i shoot him dad can i shoot him and he goes uh he goes yes <laughs> it's, when he started to say yes you know the gun went the boat bang. was already flying it was <laughs> and uh and i hit the bear and rolled it over it but the bear came up and got on its feet and my father fired and rolled it over we we it was kind of sad it. yeah but uh yeah. We got the bear. It was a nice bear, a uh, little over 200 pounds. And That's a good bear. I was pumped up. That's it a good bear. Solid, full of beech nuts. And uh, we, uh, I drug that thing down off that ridge. And, and uh, it's funny you bring that up because I think the last podcast we did, or maybe we were just talking, like I've never had an opportunity to shoot a bear just out in the woods. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. you did it. And yeah, so I'll be honest. Uh, after that experience, my father and I talked about it, and my father really, truly did love animals. Yeah. He also loved to hunt, don't get me wrong, and he loved to eat wild game. But as he got older, when we shot that bear and it didn't die immediately, yep, right. he's like, all right, we did that. Yeah. That was a good experience. He said, I don't want to ever do that again. Because he yeah. likes bears, and he likes yeah. to look at them. I, also, I think there's also something to be said, too, as someone gets closer oh, absolutely. to that point Your in their life. Your own mortality comes into... And they're uh, knocking on the door a little yeah, bit. You no, know? that is exactly right, Paul. As you, you get older... Probably have a different view on... And I think that that uh, plays into it, that uh, you're looking at your own mortality, so taking uh, another's life is... Uh, yeah. Takes on a different meaning. Yeah. Yeah. It takes he on loved a, to hunt. He hunted yeah, his my whole dad, life. My dad never shot a deer. Yeah. Never shot a bear. My father shot deer, and, nope. and uh, but that was the yep. only bear he ever shot, and I got to do that with my dad. And That's that fantastic. is a memory. I, I can see it right now. Yeah. Like it's it no burns into your mind. It does. Like, and, special uh, time. And yeah. I think he did like that, but... He was a big believer in, in uh, you know, he wanted the animal. He wanted a clean kill. He, yeah. You know, yeah. Because yeah. he does like the animals. And uh, all the yeah. years we went deer hunting, you know, once in a while, he'd go out and poke around. 
but he was not fierce to shoot a deer. Yeah. He and wasn't my, fierce. My dad wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't fierce to shoot birds, but he loved it if we were. Yeah. If you know what I mean. And loved to hear all about it. And her. wanted to hear the stories. Yeah. To live, yeah. live yeah. through you. But then to go fast forward, my first deer, actually, I was working in Holton and uh, shot a spike horn in Monticello. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Off a round bale. Just stood in yeah. the field for the afternoon. I was off and and uh, didn't think I'd see a deer. And I look up and there's a tail flitting, you know, you, n- you never know. Yards. Yeah. You never and know. I, I put, uh, I had a Ruger 270 uh, with a Redfield scope on it, put the scope up. There was a little spike horn there with a doe. And uh, so I, I put the uh, crosshairs on him and flattened him. Couldn't yeah. believe it. That was my first, first buck. So you showed me a picture a little while ago. Yeah. I've Quite a game pole full of big bucks from 2001. That was 2001. What's the what's the story behind? Because that the, was a pretty impressive game pole. That was uh, there was three over was 200. An, that right? was an exceptional year. There were three bucks on that pole, all well over 200. Uh, all the same week, three days in was a row. It, no kidding. Uh, actually, um, let me stand corrected on that. My so. The story is, uh, we went to camp. My father did not go in with us. He was coming in later. Okay. Uh, but my cousin Michael, my cousin Wid, David, my brother and I, and Harold Hubner were all at camp. And uh, to be honest, it was there was no snow, so yep. we weren't going to track. And it was really windy that week. Windy. We got into camp, I think it was on Saturday night. It may have been Sunday. I wish my brother was here because he'd correct me. Um, Monday morning, we got up to hunt, and my brother and I went together that morning. And I don't even remember where he and I went, but after a while, we came back to camp because we are doing, like we said earlier, Paul, everybody's just spreading out to see yeah. where deer are. See what's going on. This is our opening morning, and within a half hour, I killed a, a, a crutch horn. Okay. That dressed out 160 pounds. He didn't hunt a half hour. No kidding. And they, so my, everybody was gone from camp, but when my brother and I came back to camp, that buck's hanging and nobody's at camp. And so we go into camp and there's a 35 Remington casing on the table. No way. And so Jay's like, who in the world, who killed that deer? And I said, (laughs) Michael killed the deer. There's a 35 casing right there. And he's like, Sure enough, it was Michael. So Michael celebrated that night, and we were, he was poking fun, and and uh, it was good because you know we do we are competitive, but it's it's all truly it's it's all you know, everybody well, is and we, happy, and, we, and you yeah. celebrate because cause we're motivated. Yeah. Hey, we got a deer up, yeah, and yeah. in the North Main Woods, as you know, yes, that's a big thing. It's not easy. It no, is not. And, no, and I I don't want to get sidebarred here, but I was going to ask you, gentlemen. You know, I recall my father always telling me that up the, up where we hunt, it was always less than one deer per square mile, was what Fishing Game always said. But, yeah. Uh, less than one deer. But I might, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, when I, In the 50s and 60s, historically, I have heard 10 to 15 in northern Maine in, uh, in, per square mile. So the population... And I'm not, and maybe in that area, I can't speak to that, but I'm talking Musquecooks and yeah. uh, and uh, places like that. And uh, but now, but now it is than... it is that in that area, maybe a lot of areas, you know, there's a lot of square miles with no deer, no deer. at all, right? And probably overall one to two per yeah. square mile. Not many. It's a needle in a haystack. It sure is, and it's... we certainly see that today. Because and you so. Can... You can put a lot of miles on and not even cut a track. No. You are absolutely no. right to to get a buck up there. Any buck is a big accomplishment. Yeah, yep. it's a big accomplishment. Yep. I watch podcasts where they're talking about yeah, northern Maine's got all kinds of deer now, and they're talking down around Jackman. That's, me, not, that's, northern, not, that's not that's northern not northern Maine. Maine. You're in northern Maine. Yeah, and there are very few, very few deer in that. There are. Yeah. 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 All you have to do is look at the uh, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and see the, the the harvest by township, and you will see just how few deer there yeah. are there. Yeah. 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 So again, Paul, to go back, Michael had killed that 
that young four corn. So you're one deer down. One deer down. Yep. That buck dressed out 160 that's a big, pounds. That's a big four pointer. It is because yeah. of, what do you suppose that deer is a year and a half, two yeah. years old, year and a half, a year and so a half. So that deer obviously yep. probably had some good genetics. Would have been a big yep. buck. And Tuesday three morning years. we get up and Michael is tagged out, but he's like, "I'll go with you, John Wesley." He said, "You know, I'll spend the day with you." So he and I go do stuff and we're dubbing around and. I don't remember everything we did that morning, but it was windy. There was no snow, and it was sunny. And yep. uh, later that afternoon, geez, there was a bunch of scuffling in the road there, the rally road. And we got out, and there's deer tracks everywhere. And Michael said, oh, look, there was some bucks here sparring. Look yep. at all this no mess. No kidding. Yep. And he said, John Wesley, he said, these deer are probably right here. He said, just leave me here. He said, Go back, find the first road you can on the left, and get in there and start poking around. Yeah. So that's what I did. And uh, left Michael, took my truck, went down, went on the first road I could find to the left because I knew the kind of the lay of the land. And it was a big cutting, and I'm, I'm driving down the road into the cutting, and all of a sudden there were flags going everywhere. No way. And I stopped my truck and jumped out, and I, I loaded that. Uh, model 70 and i look up and there are deer bounding does and i can see antlers on some of them and i look to my left and there were a, a set of cedar trees in the cut that were still sanding but they were crossed like an x mm -hmm. and yeah. right under them was a buck standing there staring at me just oh, like him word. you could see the white on his the black nose and the white around it yeah. and his white throat patch and i could clearly see the bases of his antlers and I didn't even think. I just put the 3006 up, put the crosshairs on that white patch, squeezed the trigger, and the buck dropped in the scope. No kidding. And I got over to the deer. I, I looked up, and there was a, an even bigger buck. Oh, my word. I think what yeah. I shot was what they call a satellite buck yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Because he was yeah. 150 yards, 200 yards yeah. away. I'm not joking. And, and I... When I went and got Michael, I, he said, how far was the deer? And I said, it, it was quite a shot. I said, I don't know how I hit the thing because yeah. I was only aiming at the throat patch. But I, yeah, that's I said, I just shot. didn't have time enough to get nervous. You know, didn't I just about popped it. and shot and the deer yep. dropped in uh, pure luck. But uh, I said, what was scary was if I just looked to my right. There was another deer. There was a monster, you know, and yeah. he leaped into the green growth at the edge of the cutting. But yeah. we went up and uh, got that deer and put it in the pickup and took it back to camp and nobody was back to camp yet. And we left it in the back of the pickup and we, the deer was big. <laughs> we had a struggle to get it out yeah. uh, into the truck. And uh, anyway, we got it back to camp and we, we do have a, a, a tradition at camp yeah. that the weight of the deer is supposed to be what we weigh at camp. I think my deer on the camp scales was 217. Okay. But when we took it out to six mile, at the gateway, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. the state certified scales a week later said it was two thirty two. Whoa, holy whoa. smokes! After Field a rest. week, after a week, whoa. so that's a big deer. But anyway, uh, we celebrated that night again, and we were poking fun. And my brother went so to bed with two days, two deer, two days, two deer, uh, one over two hundred, one over two hundred, and uh, so we were excited. Wednesday morning comes, same thing. It's blustery, it's cold, windy. My cousins came in. Uh, Wid came in, and I think David. They had come in late. That's right. It was it was uh, Michael and Jay and Harold and I at first, and uh, they came in and were at camp, and they said, "Well, where's Jay?" And you know, this was around lunchtime. Yeah. And so Wid said, "Well, I'll go get him, and we'll come back and figure out what we're gonna do." So Wid went down there. Well, that morning, my brother had been sitting in that tree stand and uh, looked up and looked to his left, and here comes this buck with his nose to the ground Jeez. coming down the road. And all Jay could see were the deer had a really tall rack, and it was t a tight basket rack, nine-pointer. Yep. And uh, But he said, geez, that buck was big. And he was also hunting with his Model 70 3006. The deer came down, and... and uh, when the deer turned to step off the road into the green growth, Jay let him have it with the 3006, and the deer humped up and went over the bank and was done. Oh, my God. And Jay said, uh, 
when he came out of the ladder stand, he said he thinks he only touched one rung. <laughs> <laughs> but he's flying. but uh, he got down there, and the deer was dead, and everything was good, and the buck was big. He couldn't move it by himself. Jeez, I'm crying. So he went back, sat in the stand, and by and by, Wid, Wid came in. He was thinking this is going to be a long day. And uh, he was going to get down and field dress the deer and take yep. care of it and all that. But he was sitting there and he's like, you know, so and so is going to, somebody's going to come by and I'll get some help. And anyway, Wid came in and got him. And so Jay got down, got in the truck. And Wid was asking him, what, what have you seen? What's been going on? And Jay said, well, you know, it's been this and this. And he said, by the way, will you stop? Because I got a deer right there. Uh. And Wid goes, yeah, okay. And they kept driving. He's like, no, Wid, seriously, I got a buck right there. And uh, <laughs> anyway, they stopped, and that buck dressed out 228. Holy wow. smokes. Wow. Yeah. On the camp scales. That was on the camp scales. And yeah. what he should have done, because if you look at the deer, yeah. my brother's yeah. deer has got a much bigger chest, deeper. So his buck probably yeah. did, honestly, weigh way more, way more than, yours. than yeah. mine. But Michael was with me, and we just threw it on the scales at Gateway when we went out later in the week yeah. and uh yeah that's a big deer so, so then there's, we, there's, so there's, three days there's, there's three days three, three deer Jeez so uh, we kept hunting and then we had a couple of down days uh but we were seeing deer everybody was still yeah, seeing yeah, deer, that's... just not getting the shots yep. and actually wid my cousin wilford um had shot at a big buck at the back of a cutting out of his tree stand but he missed and we've all missed you know, we poke fun at each other when that happens, but nobody Every, really honestly cares because yeah, we there. all miss, yep. all of us. And uh, anyway, um, he also jumped that same buck. That It was a hot spot he was in. There were some does in that pocket, mm -hmm. and I think some of them were in heat. He had come out of his tree stand one day, and he was walking out the road, headed back to his truck, and he had his rifle on his shoulder, yeah. slung. And walked up on the deer. Oh! And so when he came back to camp and told us all that, we we took his sling off his rifle and about put it. him in timeout. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, they got a kick out of that. But yeah. uh, I think it was, uh, and I gosh, I wish my brother was here. I think it was Friday morning. We went in and uh, got in his stand and ended up killing that buck. It was a ten point. Yep. Uh, and that one dressed out two twenty four. Holy smokes! Yeah, that's that's a heck of a those, week. Those, one those week. That's good times. And we yeah. had those, Paul. We had, we had a year. We were six for six up there. Not yeah. all over two hundred, but we were all we were six for six up in the, up in Deer Camp. And now, how how small of an area were, were, were all these two hundred pounders taken? Like out of a similar, of all within two miles of our camp. No kidding. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So they're in a basically a two mile radius. All yeah. these big bucks. Wow. The the population, as we say, deer per square mile is not good, but boy, it, being in the North Country grows some big deer. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and and we have you know for we again we've been hunting up there for the last forty five years straight every yes. single season, and um, I can tell stories of you drive in on this road and a buck steps out. On a, you're on a Sunday, you're gathering firewood. We've done that. Oh, and the yeah. deer's so big, yeah. and people don't believe this, that its hind end is on one ditch, and its brisket is yep. almost touching the yep. other side of the road. Yep. There was one we, along Greenlaw Stream going in. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, you, yeah, the nine-mile like buck. Two or three years in a row. Yeah, the nine-mile buck. Going we, into camp, he was stood on a Sunday woods. going into deer camp for the week. He came out in front of us, Jody and I. Yeah. And he stood right in the middle of the road. Big he, deer. He was huge. He, he was yeah. huge. And then I think Joe saw him the next year. I think, yeah, it may have been the same year. Joe came out for Thanksgiving and okay. saw him. All right. Yeah, I think it was the same year. And uh, we called, it was at the Nine Mile, like you say, Greenlaw. And uh, that, was, that was a big buck. So to you, it's so much more than, I mean, we all want to be successful. And it's great to shoot a deer and stuff, but... To you, with the heritage and stuff and the, the history you have with it, it's 
goes way beyond the killing of a deer. It truly does. And again, but, uh, my it's so it's odd. My brother and I were talking about this yeah. last night sitting in his kitchen and it it is about being at camp mm. with the folks that you care mm. about. Yeah. And you whether those be your closest friends or family. Uh yeah. And everybody is excited for everybody else. And yeah, it it is just, we are so privileged to have what we have here in the state of Maine. Yes. Uh, And to, uh, to just get so fired up and, and, and have the ability to uh, get out and have access to millions of acres of, of private land. Like it's your own kingdom. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, I've, I've worked and lived in the West and I can tell you, you know, Wyoming game wardens and somebody might comment about this, but they, pri- their primary job is enforcing trespassing. Absolutely. No kidding. Not That's... fishing game laws They're, because you stepped on the corner of somebody's property. Yeah. Yeah. That's where Onyx I was became say, so big. There's the for, advent of Onyx. Yeah. Right that's yeah. where Onyx became so big out West because you had to know where you were stepping. Yeah. You did. You had to know, and I've never hunted. I have been out west. I've never hunted out in west. In Maine, and, we're lucky that if a place, place isn't posted, you can hunt. You can hunt it. Correct. Yeah. If it's not posted, yeah. Yeah, then, we, and you end up someplace. We, we've talked about you that, know, Paul, the exact same thing John said. We are so, and years ago, we took it for granted, but as we get older, we know that those things can change in a heartbeat, and yeah. we're, we're blessed to be able to, like you say, have all this land uh, available to us. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, go where we want and do what we want. No one bugs you. Absolutely. And, and that's the other great thing about the group of men that I go to camp with is they honestly do respect that. We, we know that the landowners are so good to us and we in turn, you know, we, we don't litter. You're I know not, you guys have spent miles driving in the North Main yeah. Woods, and every once in a while you'll see a soda can or a beer yeah. can or Pick it something. Up. Yeah. We don't do that. We don't yeah. violate their rules. If they post an area of men working, no hunting, we don't go in you, there. You, if, yes. if, you honor uh, that. Yeah. We, we, give, we give way to the log trucks. Yeah. Not just because it's a safety thing. We do it because that's what the landowners yeah. want. Yeah. Those are their roads, and they're there that's to right. work. That's right. They own it. And if things start going south, if people are... Are breaking those rules, like I say, that can change real quick. Yeah. They they yeah. can and, say and, no more. And that is also another thing. And I'm not trying to again run down a different tangent, but I don't think there is a single person in my group that is for Sunday hunting, which a lot of folks in Maine want that now. They, yeah. But we want our landowners who allow us to do what we do, yeah. if they want to be able to do what they want to do on a Sunday, Without we thinking, are all for it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We I'm, honor that. And we talked about that. I, yeah. I see, I'm 50-50. Like I see the, I can see the one side where yeah. you've got someone who works, you know, five days a week. Yeah. Maybe six days. Six days a week. Yeah. Limited hunting. But I also, on the flip side, like I think of the outfitters, gives right. them a day off. Yeah. Especially if someone comes up and hunts for multiple weeks, yep. it's nice to have. Because I mean, I'm not going to take a day off yeah. from hunting. It's, can't hunt on Sunday. I am now forced to kind of just like maybe reset. We, yeah, we talked about that being at deer Collect camp myself. was always really good because we'd have that big meal Sunday night, and nobody no was pressed. pressured to go out and hunt and stuff. So we yeah. really enjoyed the the deer camp uh, atmosphere, or yeah. whatever. And uh, and another thing is too. We never had it. As, as long as I've known, we've never yeah. had Sunday hunting. So it wasn't something uh, that was taken away from us. And now, you know, you, never having it, you really don't miss it. Yeah, correct. You 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 don't miss it because you never had it. It was it's always been the way it is. So yeah, it's easy to live with that way. I agree. I don't even think about it. No, nope. nor do we. No, nope. I don't. And even like think Paul about said, it. for us, it, for our group anyway, Sunday is actually a relief. It, yeah, yeah. We we get up, and that is the day we do our chores, right? Because there's ex- always firewood to process. Yeah. There's stuff to clean up. There's there's yeah. things that you do, um, and you're not worried about the next guy is in hunting your spot today while you're tending to things you have to. Tend you, to. That would be on your mind. If yeah. you, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I I've, I've never really thought about it until recently when we were talking about it. I'm like, yeah, you know, going into camp wouldn't be a very relaxing 
no ordeal. It You'd wouldn't be, be pushing as fun. to get out. Somewhere. I'd be racing in, thinking about where I wanted to go. Yeah. And yeah. Hurry, 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 and it just wouldn't be as enjoyable no. as having those two Sundays to go in and then come out of camp. Come out. Yeah. 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 How long do you guys go for? We do one serious week. Yeah. From Sunday to Sunday. Any day that Paul has off in November, we try to be there. Yeah. yeah. We. I'll be up there. He'll come up after work. We'll I work in supper. Ashland Tuesday nights. So yep. Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm in Ashland. And then I just scoot right up, close up shop and scoot right over to camp yeah. and hunt Wednesday. Yeah. So we go for two solid weeks. That's awesome. And sometimes three. Holy smokes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm that jealous. is fantastic. That is. And there's something about being that far in. And we in do your it, mind, right? it's a whole different. It, yeah. You know, it, you're that far in. Paul said it on one of his videos, and I've heard my brother say it. My brother is at my my brother is quite a writer too. He writes yeah. poetry. He writes no stories. He's, yeah. And he wrote one. Uh, I can't remember if it was a story he wrote. It might have been the story of two thousand one that went yep. the main sportsman. But you said it in one of your videos: "Is deer camp begins and ends for us on the same day." Yeah. And that's the last day of camp. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. logistics that go into what we do, because we do go for two solid weeks and sometimes three, you know, we're buying coolers full of food. And yep. that's the yep. other great thing about our group. Everybody in our group is a really good cook. Everyone pitches in probably. And we everything. eat really well. Yeah. And yeah. we really do. I mean, we have oh, yes. a lot of seafood. Oh, we, yeah. you know... We cook prime rib. We make homemade yes. spaghetti. That's we, all a big part of it. You know, John. Um, it's not homemade corned not beef, peanut, and, and yeah, we have oh New God. England boiled dinner. And, and you're not having peanut butter sandwiches. For we supper. are not having peanut nope. butter sandwiches. No, nope. and, nope. and same There's, there's same a lot thing. of pride in that. And again, everybody's a little bit competitive. So, yeah. so it's there's always yeah. that. You got to uh, you got to bring your A game when you're cooking. When that's it's your right, night. because everybody is. Yeah. You know. There we was did always... the, the same thing, John. What our system was, each one had a night. Yeah. Yeah. And generally it was the same thing. I did lasagna. It was every year. I and my wife I would love cook that it. Story. Yeah. yeah. My wife would cook it, but I would do lasagna. So Wednesday night or whatever, I, it was lasagna night. I, you know, you bring the bread and the lasagna and the salad and stuff and and Sunday night was Kevin, was the seafood, yeah. was the lobster stew. I can I remember the joke too. And I always loved hearing Dale say this first night, everyone would, you'd overindulge. You eat way too much, right? So you're yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. And the camp's like 95 degrees. Yeah. And even though it's crank. freezing yeah. cold out. And he used to say almost every Sunday, he's like, my father always, his father didn't hunt. He goes, my father always would say to me, why do you guys want to go up to that drafty old camp and starve to death? <laughs> and yeah. he's like, yeah. who is cold and who's hungry? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, every, every one of the the guys at our camp, Michael, Wilfred, my brother, they're all exceptional cooks. They're really, really good. And we eat really well and they take pride in making meals. And I'll tell you, that's another thing. Um, and, and again, this is a lot of those meals are made from scratch at camp. Yeah. Uh, I cheated. (laughs) Well, and, and what I was going to say, say, Mark, is we (laughs) have transitioned over the years. So when we first started going, and got going serious with the group that we're now all young men and we actually hunt, not my brother and I being little. Yeah. We actually hunt. Um, yeah. The way we used to do it back then was everybody paid a deposit. Okay. And my mother would go do the shopping and David Minkton's did the cooking. No kidding. And we would have a menu written out, just like you said yeah. in your video. My brother would put together a menu. There would always be something special in it, and it got sent to everybody. There'd be photos of past yeah. hunts or bucks, or there'd be a weather report. We got yeah. snow in the forecast, blah, blah, blah. So parallel yeah. in so many ways. And it Derek was, would do that. He was the head of the camp, Derek, Cody. Yeah. He, and he would do. He would send us weather reports and stuff, and in, yeah, invitation yeah. Yeah. beginning of the year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Have, sometimes it was poetry, and one time there was a poem that was. Yeah, Kevin wrote some some out. poems there the where path. it had yeah. like everyone's names and the areas that they hunted. Yeah, like our code names for things. Yeah, yeah. all kind of in the yeah. poem. Um, Derek yeah. also he's very organized. He would he always saved his receipts from yeah. every year. He would do the shopping, so we yeah. had like a group. Yeah, groceries. That's the and way then we did 
dinners where one person yeah. uh, did a dinner. We usually did that on the way in on Sunday too. We and would go would, to the grocery store yeah. and we would get all and we he would always all we always hit Ellis's seats. market in Patton. And he would yeah. be like, "Yeah, what Great did we run short store. on last year? What were we good on?" And he had it right down to a right. exactly well, how too many much gallons, bread yeah. or too little bread. So we got to up it next year yeah. and stuff. And he yeah. was see, you pretty, need people like that. In yeah. Camp. Who and Derek was stuff. good at it. My Derek brother is yeah. yeah. my yeah. brother is yeah. a logistics analytical. Yeah. Derek was just logistics. very little yeah. wasted. Very just little right wasted. My, yeah. And my brother, you know, he's on that stuff. We have transitioned to now. What we do is we come up with a menu, and they decide. So Paul's going to do this, this, this. He's got three days that he's got to provide for yeah. breakfast and, and dinner. Yeah. You've got three days. I've got three days. And yeah. then we sit down, we put that menu together, and then we go do our own shopping because we're the ones doing yep. the cooking right. yep. those days. Yeah. And that's that's how we do yeah. it now. And it, and it's easier than one person trying to buy food for eight guys. Yeah. yeah. I can remember, yeah. Paul, and you probably did the same thing, John, that when it was your night, you would say, well, I got to get back a little early tonight. You know, I can't hunt until dark because... I got to get Gotta back and start preparing. You yeah. wanted to have, you know, you we didn't want to wait until eight o'clock to eat. Yeah, you know, so you get to get back. Somebody, well, I got to get back a little early tonight. It's it's my night for supper to cook. and stuff. Yeah, so we. Uh, yeah. My cousin Wid really, he loves to cook, and he'll he'll take over a lot of times. No, no kidding. Even if you, there's always that like guy. he's like if Paul's got cream chicken or or yeah. you know uh, big stuffed haddock or whatever. Yeah. Wid will just say, well, I, I got the meal. And Wid will be back at camp at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He'll okay. start getting dinner right. ready and yeah. right. for everybody yeah. to come through the door. Uh, yeah. Paul's yes. a good cook. We, Paul, Paul's a very good cook. Oh, oh I've, I've seen I some did. of your meals, but I would like to try your Dutch oven pizza. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's good. But your yeah. deer steak and fiddleheads. And I, oh, I, yeah, I sit yeah, in Alaska yeah. and I go, man, I wish that I was, was yeah. The, so one of fishing. the traditions we ha- <clears throat> excuse me, we have, John, is... We always saved a deer roast, and I don't think we have one this year, Paul. I don't know. I have one. Okay. I had we, to, I we, had to we, steal one from my father-in-law. A, we got, of course, we have electricity, so we have a, a slow cooker. Yeah. We put a, the uh, the deer roast in with onions and potatoes and and carrots, and uh, that would we would put that on when we left the camp in the morning yeah. to go hunting. And we would walk in that night, and that'd been cooking all day. And, and you get that smell. You, you last can, year's deer, usually. Yes, is, yeah, you, last yeah. year's deer roast. That yeah. was always a tradition. Yeah. yeah. You put in a Lipton's onion soup mix with it there, and uh, yeah, that was... Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was that's dangerous. one of my brother's favorite things, to come in. You're, yeah. You've been cold all day. Yeah, you've been you out that at smell it, and camp's warm, warm oh, and yeah. camp smells good because of the food. And, yeah. And you appreciate... Yeah. That stuff so much more. You do. After doing that all day, a you hot do. meal. Yeah. yeah. And I love that camp. story you told on your video about dragging that buck forever. That one long, long drag. Yeah. And oh. at the end of it, you go, I ate a lot of lasagna that night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, so, been, there's been a few times. That, so that, that year I shot a deer early, and that year I drove out for Thanksgiving meal. That was Thanksgiving Day. Wasn't I shot it. it yeah. yeah. Jody and I went in. Yeah. And so I, I wasn't remember, there to help I was, you. I, was, I like to get away from people. Far, so we're the same way. Farther away I can get from someone, the better off. I, you you I would walk it. four miles. In I was on that four road. miles. So it was a road yeah. that you couldn't drive, and I went. There was some good deer sign in there, and we actually had got a little skiff of snow that night, and I hoofed her all the way in there, and I shot a deer that morning, and it was like nine thirty. I think I finished cleaning it up like ten o'clock or whatever, and I'm like, Jody, my cousin, was the other guy in there hunting, and I'm like, I'm not gonna bug him. Yeah. I got all day to get this deer. So I li- literally went 100 yards at a time. I'd take my gun and pack and all that stuff, go down the road, put it 100 yards, grab the deer, drag it 100 yards. I did this all day long. Wow. And uh, we got a snowstorm that night. Yeah. And it was just getting dark. And Well, actually, it was completely dark at this point because Jody was walking out. He'd walked all the way out to the truck. And he's like, Paul's not here. And he, I pretty soon I see a figure coming down the road. He's like, what are you doing? So I'm dragging on a deer. It was snowing like crazy. And uh, yeah, he finished the last couple hundred yards or whatever to get out of there. But man, I was... That's I, awesome. That was, was like, what a great story. Oh yeah. You feel and so something good. something you're going to remember for the rest of the You feel again. so good. Yeah. You get back to camp. You're like, yeah. oh my word. This yeah. Hot food. You're and- successful. 
you're tired, you're hungry. Everybody wants to hear the story. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. And that truly is what it is about for us at our camp. It is that combination of all yeah. of it. It is. Yeah. It isn't, you know, we do want to harvest a deer. That's the icing on the yeah. cake, though. That is. Well, there you have it. That's the completion of part one of this two-part series. We had some wonderful conversation with John. So stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss part two. Take care.